Okay. So the abandoning of the hindrances <clears throat> is the next step. But the 67, endowed with a noble aggregate of moral discipline, restraint over the sense faculties, noble mindfulness and clear comprehension, noble contentment. So this is the this is the warm up. This is the background. This is what you got to do before you sit down to meditate. One resorts to a secluded dwelling. All right. And so here's a list of potential secluded dwellings, a forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a cremation ground, a jungle grove, the open air, a heap of straw. The whole idea is go someplace where you won't be disturbed. All right. So not some place where they're doing handicrafts or cooking food or selling things or playing a TV, some place where you won't be disturbed. And then after returning from alms round, my understanding is that the Buddha and the monks would go on alms round, I don't know, 10 or 11 in the morning, eat the midday meal, and then they would go for the days abiding. They would go into the forest and sit at the root of a tree and meditate until it got dark which given this is India and it's close to the equator, um, yeah, six hours of meditation. I doubt they were doing a 45 minute sit, 45 minute walk. These people could sit cross-legged, right? So yeah, go and do a three hour sit, take a pee break, do another three hour sit, maybe something like that. And then we get the hindrances. The first one is given in this sutta as covetousness for the world. In other suttas, we see it as something like the desire for sensual gratification. I translate it as simply sense desire. It's the wanting aspect of the mind. So when you're meditating and you become distracted, it's very helpful to label your distractions. The first label that comes to mind is always correct. It spends zero energy trying to get the perfect label. And so wanting or any other possibility. And if, if you say wanting, you know it's the first hindrance, right? <clears throat> one dwells with a mind free from covetousness, one purifies one's mind from covetousness. For dealing with sens sensual desire, the best strategy I can give you is take a look at the limitations of whatever it is you're desiring. Uh, it's got limitations. No, it's impermanent. Uh, it's less than perfect. If it's a person that you're desiring, well, if, if you think they're Mr. or Miss Wright, uh, they're probably not interested in you. I suspect Mr. and Miss Wright have already hooked up with each other and we're left with what's left. Okay, so everybody's going to be less than perfect. I mean, if you're if you're totally perfect, then, well, what are you doing here? You should be teaching the class, right? So we all got our problems here. And anybody that you're lusting after, they have their problems too. They're less than perfect. And that thing, it's less than perfect. I mean, if it's expensive, you're going to need to increase your insurance payments or put an alarm in your house or, I mean, you know, the... The list is endless of how things are less than perfect. So if you find yourself caught in a hindrance of wanting, examine what you're wanting and see it's less than perfect aspects. Okay. If it's food, eat less food. You know, you don't get to the place of not wanting food by eating more food. Right. You will temporarily, but it'll just come back and you'll want it again. If you can wean yourself to eating less and less food, then food is not a problem. It's also helpful for overcoming uh, sloth and torpor. Uh, having abandoned ill will and hatred. Okay, ill will and hatred. That, this is sort of the most egregious form of aversion or not wanting. So the first hindrance is wanting. The second hindrance is not wanting. He dwells with a benevolent mind, sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from will, ill will and hatred. The number one thing to do if you find yourself with aversion, ill will, hatred, anger, anything like that, label it and then see, can you drop it? Oh, and when you 
finish the label and you come back to your meditation object like the breath, relax. Whatever that distraction was, probably put a little tension in there. Yeah, just relax. Okay? And then back to your object. But if it keeps pulling you away and it's aversion, the antidote is metta practice. So drop the attention on the breath or the body scan or whatever you're doing and just start doing metta. You don't have to do the metta for the person towards whom you're having the adverse reaction. That may be too much. Do metta for yourself. Do metta for your best friend, your significant other, the Dalai Lama. You know, just find somebody to do metta for. And do it long enough so that it's mood altering. I mean, you can tell when you start doing metta in a aversive state of mind, it's just sort of rote doing metta. But eventually, hopefully, you get to where, yeah, it feels different. You've, you've got the mood altering part happening. And so get to that point and do it some more. And then you can go back to your breath or your body scan, or you can just keep doing metta. Metta is a great practice. If I could only do one practice, you know, they came to me and they said, you can only do one practice. I choose metta. You know, what a, what a wonderful thing. Having abandoned dullness and drowsiness, one dwells perceiving light, mindful and clearly comprehending. Dullness and drowsiness is one translation. Sloth and torpor is the usual translation. Um, yeah, it's too little energy. It could be physical. You didn't get enough sleep last night and you sit down to meditate and you're falling asleep. Or it can be mental. Yeah, I know it's time to meditate, but I just don't feel like it. All right. If it's physical, you can do things like pinch and pull your earlobes. If you know where the acupressure points are on the side of your ear, you can squeeze those really hard. Rub your cheeks. You can stand up. You can open your eyes. Look at the brightest light you can see. Um, stand up is sort of like okay if nothing else is working stand up if you stand up you can continue doing whatever form of meditation you were doing breath metta body scan or you can notice the subtle sensations in your feet as you keep your balance it's very important when you do standing meditation to flex your knees if you lock your knees you'll pass out and fall and it'll be unpleasant dukkha all right so flex your knees and I've meditated a lot by just putting my attention in my feet and noticing just the subtle sensations there. They're subtle, so you have to concentrate. That's good. And then if you feel like, okay, you're energized again, you can sit back down and continue your meditation. Or, yeah, maybe you just continue to do the standing meditation to the end of the period. Okay? If it's more like laziness, uh, meditate again the best thing is some inspiration there's a lot of little books out there you know each chapter is a page or two or three pages of inspiring stuff uh, stuff from jack cornfield i know he has a couple of those they're around get yourself something you find inspiring i mean it could be a big long thick book and you just read a couple pages in it it could be a translation of the suttas and you just read a sutta or two or three Right. Find something that's inspiring, and that can definitely help with, okay, yeah, all right, now I'm ready to meditate. So find some inspiration. It's useful to have an altar that has, you know, picture of the Buddha, picture of the Dalai Lama, picture of, yeah, I mean, there's tons of inspiring people around. Um, and so, yeah, you sit down in front of them, and they're like, oh, yeah, they're all looking at me. I got to do this. That can be perhaps enough inspiring. Okay. Having abandoned restlessness and worry. It's usually translated as restlessness and worry, but I looked up the Pali and remorse would be a much better translation. It's worry about what happened in the past. It's not worry about what might happen in the future. I would say worry about the future would actually go under aversion. Because generally, if you're worried about the future, you're averse to something terrible happening. And that's why you're worrying about it. So I would put that under aversion. But it doesn't matter. I mean, these are just categories to try and help you. 
But if it's a worrying about, oh, I shouldn't have said that to that person. That was really kind of unskillful. Yeah, that's the remorse. Okay. <clears throat> So having abandoned restlessness and remorse, one dwells at ease within oneself with a peaceful mind. Um, hence for that are much learning, asking questions, uh, associating with wise people, things like that. I would say that if you sit down and you're physically restless, it may be better to like go for a brisk walk know, something to burn some energy. This can also be useful if you're sleepy. Go for a brisk walk and get your energy up. So trying to find that middle space on energy. Uh, if it's in the mind that, that's restless, yeah. Um, find some you know, something inspiring to read, something like that. Restlessness can show up in a lot of subtle ways. I noticed when I was spending a lot of time at the forest refuge and I was doing relatively long sittings, I mean, an hour and a half was pretty typical, that at some point I would start getting very restless. And I realized that actually I was getting uncomfortable, but I was paying so little attention to my body, I didn't notice the discomfort, but my body noticed and it started showing up as mental restlessness. And so that's a thing to check. It's actually quite important that you meditate in a comfortable position. Just above this, we had one sits down cross-legged, holds one's body erect and sets up mindfulness before oneself. I would say, yeah, if you can sit cross-legged, great. But we have these evil things called chairs and they've screwed up our ability to sit cross-legged. So sit in a chair, kneel on a bench, lie down if necessary. If you lie down to meditate, pull your knees up so your feet are flat on the bed or floor or whatever you're lying on. And your knees are up, making a little triangle there with your feet and your the point where your knees touch each other. Okay. Um, and then one sets up mindfulness before oneself. So literal translation, one sets up mindfulness at the mukta. Mukta means mouth. But I think it's like the mouth of a cave, the opening. And I'm assuming that's the opening at the nostrils. But yeah, the rest of this. So in the 10 fetters that bind us to the wheel of samsara, restlessness is the last one of these hindrances to go. You know, as long as you're not fully awakened, there's a tendency for restlessness to be there. And if it's bodily restlessness, that can be taken care of with exercise, usually. If it's mental restlessness, uh, yeah, that's, that's harder. You also might want to pay attention to your caffeine intake. That can certainly lead to bodily restlessness as well as mental restlessness. And then having abandoned doubt, one dwells as one who has passed beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. The unperplexed about wholesome states appears to be something that's in there to counteract the Jains. The Jains were a different religion tradition at the time of the Buddha, and they were making a big deal about finding wholesome states. The Jains were basically trying to avoid any negative karma, because if you created any negative karma, then you were going to be reborn and have to do it all over again. And they wanted to not be reborn. They had craving for non-existence, basically, vibhava tanha. And they were really trying to find the unwhole, figure out what were the unwholesome states so they couldn't do that. So it's a big deal. And I think that's what prompted this to be put into this here, doubt about what is wholesome or unwholesome, because the Jains are making a big deal about it. And what the Buddha is saying, yeah, you can overcome the doubt. You know what's wholesome and unwholesome. You're practicing the precepts. But the doubt can show up in other ways as well. And I think that's what's much more common. There could be doubt about the Buddha. Did you really know what he was talking about? Doubt about the Dharma. Is this the truth? 
doubt about the Sangha. Did anybody else get enlightened? Can somebody today get enlightened? Doubt about the teaching? Is this really what the Buddha was saying? Is this, is this accurate? Doubt about the teacher? I mean, today you're listening to a retired hippie computer programmer. You might, you might have your doubts. Who is this guy? I have a degree in math. I didn't study this stuff, right? And then the most insidious doubt of all, doubt about yourself. I can't do this. This is too hard. This, this will really stop you on the path. But this is hard. I mean, if the spiritual path was easy, we'd have all gotten fully awakened a long time ago, right? Yeah, it's hard. It's going to be a lot of hard work. But the rewards are immense. But you just got to put in the work to do it. And it's a slog at times. This is why for each of these hindrances in the commentary to the commentary to the commentary, yes, they have that. It says that noble friends and noble conversations are antidotes for all of the hindrances. In fact, this is a story of Ananda coming to see the Buddha and saying, Venerable Sir, I say that noble friends and noble conversations are half the holy life. And the Buddha says, do not say so, Ananda. Noble friends and noble conversations are the entire holy life. It's really difficult to do this by yourself. I mean, I totally admire the Buddha for pulling it off. I also know I couldn't do this without the support of my noble friends with whom I have noble conversations. I was in Jack Cornfield's teacher training program, and each time we met, we'd meet for four days, four times a year for four years, and each time we met, we would spend one of those days with some other teacher, and the best teacher that we spent time with was the late Yvonne Rand, who used to live out at, uh, by Muir Beach, out there by the Green Gulch Center. And she said two things that are really important. One was, don't believe your own publicity. And two, you must have friends that will call you on your stuff. Anytime you do something stupid, you have to have friends that will tell you that was stupid. Right? And this is so valuable. And I do have friends like that. And they are... They're worth much more than their weight in gold. I mean, all of us do stupid things. I mean, come on, we're not enlightened. We do stupid stuff. And it's really important to get the feedback from your friends when you have a stupid idea or you're going to do a stupid thing to help you stay on path. And having noble friends with whom you can have noble conversations really helps with the doubt. The doubt about... I can't do this. And your friend says, yes, you can. Look at the progress you've made. And they should, you know, point out to you what you were like five years ago when you were a complete idiot and how much smarter you are now with your behavior or anything like that. So, yeah, noble friends and noble conversations are what is needed for overcoming all of the hindrances. And it's especially helpful for doubt. And then what follows is the similes I gave you, the being in debt, being uh, physically ill, being in prison, uh, being a slave, and traveling through the desert as similes for wanting, not wanting, too little energy, too much energy, and doubt. Questions, comments? Malcolm. Hi, Lee. Lovely to see you. Good it's to see a, you. Are, are you coming to to us from Australia? Yeah, 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 of course. It's early you got morning. up early. <laughs> yeah, I got up early. I often get up early to attend these things. And it's really lovely to hear your stories and connect with you again. I just had a, it was, it's a bit of a, an intellectual question. Mm -hmm. um, when you spoke about restlessness being the last hindrance to disappear, I'm also aware of the effectors and... Right. Uh, and aware that the fetter of uh, mana or the conceit I am as being the last fetter. 
that will disappear, which disappears in our hardship. Can you make a comment about that? Is it do, when all the when all the hindrances disappear, that means we're awake, right? But uh, yeah, when so, the hindrances disappear temporarily, oh, of course, we are set up for doing the right. concentration practice. Yeah, yeah. Got when it. they are uprooted completely, you're yeah. fully awakened, right? Got it. Yeah. And the last hindrance really is, as you said, the conceit, the conceiving of a self. Yeah. If you have no self, there's nobody to get restless. So that takes care of the restlessness at that point. And that's it, our hardship. The, the doubt goes at the first stage of awakening. And the greed and aversion are weakened at the second stage and uprooted at the third stage. Yeah. Yeah. And the... Uh, the sloth and torpor isn't ever mentioned. Uh, the, the commentaries, you know, plug it in there somewhere, but I don't remember where because, yeah, the Buddha didn't talk about it. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Sure. Lovely, to, lovely to see you and hear you again. Great. Yeah. Victoria. Thank you. Um, this is actually a question I had before, so it's a little bit out of... Um, uh, off topic, um, but I forgot what my question was. So I put my hand down <laughs> before lunch um, and then just now it came back to me. Um, it's kind of a fraught question, but just as it, I'm, I know uh, quite a number of um, prominent Buddhist teachers, I won't name them of course out of discretion, but who maintain what I view as a very, well, judgmentally, <laughs> the judgmental mind, I view as a kind of hypocritical stance insofar as they um, are very dogmatic about being um, atheistic, no beliefs, Buddhism is not a religion, it's a practice, blah, blah, blah. And yet um, in the creation of their altars and the way that they also sort of practice and the way they encourage uh, others to practice, it strikes me um, as, as a very, um, that they're, they're very religious. So they're, they're kind of talking out of both sides of their mouths and it, it just, um, it was, uh, so I'm just, I, I can't remember why it came up this morning, but um, I'm just concerned about like this idea of the altar, like how far do you go with that? Because I know in other religions, there's that whole issue of um, uh, graven images, worship, you know, like in Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I feel like, like, for example, the Tibetans that at least the ones I've encountered are very straightforward about that. Um, but it seems like in the Western sort of Vipassana tradition, it seems very muddled. And I just wondered about your take on that, because um, while I think it's, you know, fine either way, it's just what disturbs me is when one hears contradictions all the time from the same people. Yeah. So uh, setting up an altar can be inspiring, but it should not be worshipped. All right. That's very clear. And how or if it's inspiring is up to each individual. Uh, maybe you don't have an altar. That's fine. Maybe it, you, you can't relate to it. Uh, maybe you have a very elaborate altar because when you sit down in front of it, it puts you in the mood for doing your practice. So I'm going to look at it more from a practical standpoint of if you have an altar, is this helpful? you should not imbue your altar with anything that is going to on its own change you right it's going to inspire you perhaps but you know having a statue of the buddha is not going to make you enlightened right you've got to do the practice to get there well so. i guess i guess what i'm aiming at is kind of in the uh, that's why it came up this morning in when you were talking in the sense of um, of craving, that mm -hmm. that it it get, it seems to me that the more I mean, when the more one invests in the material world, the more one is 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 prone to craving. Not that one will yeah. necessarily. So I, in that sense, I almost wonder um, if it can serve as a hindrance. I mean, I'm an art historian yeah. professionally, so I have nothing against beautiful things at all. But but it's that it's that fine line between. Um, appreciating and coveting yeah, or exactly. clinging or, or making it a crutch that you need it in order to practice that, that without the altar, you, you feel bereft in some way. Yeah. 
and you don't want to go to those negative places. I mean, if you find the altar inspiring, great, have an inspiring altar, but don't get attached. That's always, that's always the rule. Don't get attached, whatever it is. So, yeah. And the, the teachers who are more teaching from a materialist perspective, um, yeah, they might still have an altar because they find it inspiring. You know, it's a reminder, oh yeah, there's something better than just what I'm doing here in my regular life. I can actually up my game. And I got reminded because I looked at the altar and I've got the Buddha and I've got the Dalai Lama and I've got my teacher and I've got this other teacher and so forth. I'm just wondering, like 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 Christians say, what would Jesus say? I always wonder with this altar business, what would what would the Buddha say? Like <laughs> Did he want yeah. to be worshipped? I mean, it's no. it's it's that human nature to want to put on a pedestal everything that we admire and that we aspire to. So I see it as a, I see that in general as as in human nature as a hindrance. This um, right. transference and 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 worship. Yeah, and originally there wasn't a representation of the Buddha. The Buddha was represented as. Uh, a pair of footprints okay mm -hmm. he's gone to you know gone to awakening um <clears throat> and occasionally a few other things but it was not a human representative if the first buddha statues come out of gandhara which is where alexander the great left some of his generals to form kingdoms and they were influenced by buddhism coming in from kashmir in northwestern india into what is now Afghanistan. And these were Greeks. So of course they made statues because the Greeks make great statues and they made the first statues of the Buddha in the San Francisco Art Museum, uh, uh, which is in the old library downtown San Francisco, definitely worth going to see. There's a lot of Buddha statues there and they have a Gandharan statue. And if you didn't know any better, you would look at it and go, oh yeah, this is obviously Greek. Hmm. It, it looks like Apollo because it was modeled after statues of Apollo, but it's the Buddha. <clears throat> so yeah, um, this is a later thing of having statues and of course photographs and you know all this sort of stuff. Originally, it was, yeah, maybe a pair of feet. And for the Dharma, a wheel with eight spokes, right? That was, that was the representation, the, the art that was available. But if you, oh. if you find some useful, go ahead, use it. Don't get yeah, it. It's, no, it's not, it's not about my own practice. It's more that I, I um, maybe because I'm an art historian, I, I feel like there, sometimes there's an ambiguity in, in the way that, Westerners teach um, mm -hmm. the practice that they they themselves are unclear on the um, that that fine line. Yeah. So maybe I'm being too judgmental, but I felt safe with you to bring it up. <laughs> I just... Yeah. Since this is being recorded, I'm not going to discuss what I find wrong with other teachers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I didn't mention any names. Anyway, thank you. That that's a lot to think about. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Tom. Thank you very much. I appreciated your comments about the uh, restlessness and remorse being more about um, remorse and um, regret. Um, the, the kind of worry fits with my own experience. I had a question about something more global. What if you have a sense of regret or remorse about yourself? What about, I guess in the old days, they would call it an inferiority complex. It's a kind of global sense that you're not good enough. And I wondered, is it, would it be possible to consider that as like a lack of um, sympathetic joy or maybe a lack of metta? Uh, you know, and would these practices address that problem? Anyway, I'll take my answer. Thank you. That's my only question. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So, Definitely metta practice for yourself will help. <clears throat> when Ayakema was first teaching me to do interviews, she said, ask them about their metta practice and ask them what it's like to do metta for themselves. And you must pre it press upon them the importance of doing metta for themselves. Because 
Yeah, <clears throat> when I started teaching, it was very disheartening to find out how much self-loathing even, let alone a low self-esteem there is in our culture. Um, I wasn't totally shocked because I remember going to James Barris' Thursday night class, which I did for over a decade, and him asking, how many people have low self-esteem? 95% of the room raised their hands. How many people have high self-esteem? Three of us raised our hands. I was one of them. There were probably 60 to 80 people in the room. Three people with high self-esteem. Um, yeah. The thing I can recommend, okay, I have to get on my website again. Um, okay, I just put a link in there in the chat. So um, it's a recommendation, which basically is every time you have a thought of low self-esteem, I, I always screw up. I'm no good, anything like that. You have to blow it up with TNT. That's not true. You say to yourself, that's not true. And then you find a counterexample. Actually find two counterexamples. So yeah, um, the, the greatest failing of Western civilization is the epidemic of low self-esteem in the culture. And so take a look at this. Remember, this is my invention. I'm a computer programmer. I'm not a psychotherapist. But you may find this useful is to use your mindfulness. And every time you encounter a negativity about yourself, blow it up with TNT. That's not true. And to prove it's not true, you find counterexamples. This, this is really, really important. Um, and yeah, doing meta for yourself. I mean, one round of meta for yourself is not going to fix it. Doing meta for yourself for years will definitely help. Um, uh, Sharon Salzberg. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sharon Salzberg talks about um, at one point, she had very low self-esteem at one point she was in the bathroom and she dropped a glass jar of something and it broke and she said to herself you're such a klutz but i love you anyhow <laughs> and that was a true breakthrough for her she actually could feel the love for herself and that's where you want to get to where you can feel the love you have for yourself Love for yourself doesn't mean you're perfect. Love for yourself means that you recognize you like to be happy. Yeah, I like to be happy. Well, that's loving yourself, recognizing that you like to be happy. Okay. Thank you. All right, so no hands up on the hindrances. So when one sees that these five hindrances are unabandoned, he regards that as a debt, a sickness, confinement in prison, slavery, a desert road. But when one sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned, one regards that as freedom from debt, as good health, as release from prison, as freedom from slavery, as a place of safety. And then comes a very interesting verse. This is number 76. The commentaries go completely off track here, I think. Verse 76 is a, what I call the jhana summary. When one sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within oneself, pamoja arises. It's translated here as gladness. Ayakima translated as worldly joy. All right, some pleasure. When one is gladdened, rapture arises. Rapture is a translation of piti. Uh, rapture is a common translation, euphoria, ecstasy, delight, interest. My favorite translation is glee. It's a physical, uplifting, energetic response. When one's mind is filled with piti, one's body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in body, one experiences sukha. That could be translated as happiness or joy. Being happy, one's mind becomes concentrated. Samadhi. 
This is the jhana summary. Find something pleasant. How about a mind that's free from the hindrances? Enjoy that pleasant mind state or some physical pleasure like smile. No, they tell you to smile when you meditate. Well, if you smile when you meditate, there's your pamoja. Your gladness is, is here. From that, you can set up a positive feedback loop by focusing on this pleasantness and PT will arise. When the PT arises, and then when it calms, it'll leave you in a tranquil state where you're very happy and you can ride that happiness into concentration. That's the jhanas. Now, of course, this may not appear to you to be the jhanas unless you have a deep understanding of the jhanas. So guess what comes next? All right. I suspect number 76 is a later insertion. I do not think it was in the Buddha's original talk. I think it got inserted into the gradual training because it sort of interrupts the flow here. Uh, but it's good, it's good Dharma, and it sh that same thing shows up in numerous places in the Anguttara Nikaya, as well as several other places. And in the, I think, footnotes to my book, Right Concentration, I enumerate all the places it shows up in the chapter, uh, the Jhana Summary, if you want more on that. But the jhanas, quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, in other words, the hindrances, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by, well, vitaka and vichara. Vitaka means thinking and vichara means examining or pondering. The applied and sustained thought that you see on your screen is translated via the Vasudhi Maga. And yeah, they got it wrong. They got it wrong because in the Vasudhi Maga, the commentary from like eight centuries after the Buddha, they were describing very different states from what's being described in this sutta. Unfortunately, Bhikkhu Bodhi is a fan of the Vasudhi Maga, so he translated it as the Vasudhi Maga translates it. Uh, initial and sustained attention to the meditation subject basically, which yes, that happens, but that's not what those words mean. Vitaka and Vichara mean thinking and examining. This is background thinking. When the first jhana comes on, well, it's filled with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So this physical uprush of energy, as well as an emotional sense of happiness. And there's probably going to be the thing here. Oh, wow, that's pretty amazing. What's this? Or after you've done it a lot. All right, here we go. So there'll be some background thinking. It won't be thinking about your trip to Hawaii. Okay, it'll be commenting on the experience. So that's the Vitaka Vichara. And then one drinks deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So there's no part of one's entire body not suffused by the rapture and happiness. All right, that's, that's the advanced practice. The first thing to do is get the PT and Sukha going. And the way to get it going is get to what's referred to in the commentaries as access concentration, sufficient concentration to give you access to the jhanas. And we can define that as being fully with the object of meditation for example, your breath. And if there are thoughts, they're wispy and in the background and don't pull you off into distraction. Okay? So you're just there. And you know each in-breath, you know each out-breath. And after you've stabilized that, to then focus on something pleasant, like your smile or the warm tingly glow in your hands or something. And if you can stay focused on something that's much more subtle without getting distracted, and it's also pleasant, then you'll set up a positive feedback loop of pleasure and the PT and Sukha will arise. It may be only upper torso, neck, head at first, but over time you get skilled enough so that you can spread it through your whole body. That's the drench, steep, saturate, suffuse part. Okay. And then we have the simile of taking a metal basin and pouring in water and soap flakes and mixing it together to make a ball of soap. You didn't go to the store and buy a bar of soap. You had your skilled bath attendant make you a ball. 
right? And so this is the water, which is the PT and Sukha mixing with your body, which is the soap flakes till it's you're totally permeated. But this is an advanced practice. The first thing to do is to get in the first time. The next thing to do is to get in the second time. Then to get in multiple times and sustain it. And then you can try spreading it to other parts of your body by simply moving your attention from wherever the PT Sukha, say around your face, feel strong. Just move your attention, not the PT Sukha. You don't know how to do move that. You do how to move, know how to move your attention and it'll spread through the rest of your body. But you got to have stable first jhana before you can try that, because otherwise you start moving and you just fall out of it. All right, and this is the first visible fruit of the spiritual life, more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Okay. Second jhana, the subsiding of vitaka and vichara, the thinking and examining. In other words, your mind gets much quieter. On a 10 day retreat, you're probably not going to get to the point where all the thoughts disappear. I mean, remember, this, this is the curriculum for the monks and nuns, people that are on permanent retreat. Okay, even in a month long retreat, you're probably not going to get a lot of points where there's no thinking, but the gaps between your thoughts become larger. Okay, the thinking recedes even further into the background. One enters and dwells in the second jhana, which is accompanied by it says internal confidence, a better translation would be inner tranquility and unification of mind. This is the one pointed mind that really coalesces around the filled with rapture and happiness born of concentration that follows. And in a sense, what you're doing when moving from the first jhana to the second jhana is a foreground background shift. First jhana, the PT, the physical component is going to dominate and the emotional, the sukha, the joy, happiness is going to be in the background. Take a deep breath, let the energy calm down. And now the emotional is going to uh, predominate and you focus on that. And there'll still be some physical energy in the background, but instead of your hair standing on end or vibrating or a hot flash or anything like that, Maybe some rocking or some swaying, you know, it's, it's a lot less energy. Okay. And again, one is to fill the whole body. First, you got to get to second jhana. You got to get there regularly. You got to get there so you can sustain it for a while. And then the same thing, wherever it feels the strongest, which for many people is the heart center, then you just move your attention to some other place. And, uh, feeling of happiness will follow along. And the simile is of a lake and there's no streams or rain coming in, but a spring at the bottom and the upwelling of the spring water fills the whole lake. This is a absolutely brilliantly accurate simile for the second jhana. The second jhana feels like out of your heart, you have this wellspring of happiness, which is just filling you. Um, it, whoever came up with this, the Buddha, or whoever, really did a brilliant job of capturing what the second jhana feels like. And so now you're just happy for no reason other than you have a concentrated mind. Normally, we get happy because some external circumstance. Somebody says, oh, you did a great job on that. Or they give you a birthday present or whatever. And your happiness is triggered by something external. But notice your happiness is triggered. The happiness isn't in the present or in their words saying you did a good job. The happiness, well, like everything else you experience, it's just a bunch of neurotransmitters in your brain. What you're doing with the second jhana is learning to trigger those neurotransmitters with your concentration without an external circumstance to trigger. Third jhana. With the fading away of PT, one dwells in equanimity, mindful and clearly comprehending and experiences happiness with the body. By this point, the body is receded into the background. But it's not as prominent. It's certainly not like it was in the first jhana where it's completely taking up the foreground. But it's in the background and 
I notice my posture just automatically gets perfect when I'm in the third jhana. I don't try to do anything, but yeah, just everything is just perfect. Uh, the body is really contented. <clears throat> Thus one enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. The noble ones are the awakened ones, the enlightened ones. So is the state of mind of the third jhana a foretaste of Nibbana, a state of happiness, equanimity, and mindfulness. Well, I can't tell you because I still got work to do, all right? But, you know, I don't know any place else where the noble ones are declaring one dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness in regard to anything else. So maybe the third jhana, hanging out in the third jhana is what it's like to be fully awakened. I don't know. You'll have to do the work and then you can let me know. All right. I'm counting on you. And once again, one drenches deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with a happiness free from rapture. <clears throat> And the simile now is a lotus pond where the lotuses come out of the mud, but don't come above the surface of the water. They're not waving in the breeze. They're not bobbing up and down on the surface. They're underwater. Okay. And they're filled with water from their tips to their roots. This points to somewhat of the feeling of isolation you get in the third jhana. When you're that well concentrated, you're, yeah, you're just not really aware of the outside world like you were when you first sat down to meditate or even when you got into the first or second jhana. There's a real sense of, you know, the outside world is further away by this point. And then the fourth jhana, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous passing away of joy and grief. Now, this doesn't mean there was pain or grief in any of the previous jhanas, but there was pleasure in the first three jhanas the rapture pt that's pleasurable the happiness is pleasurable the second jhana you still got pt and sukha that's pleasurable third jhana you just got sukha it's more like contentment than happiness right more like a, a sense of deep satisfaction but it's pleasurable and the pa previous passing away of joy and grief in the first and second jhanas you have joy the sukha is quite strong one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful. It's an emotionally neutral mind state and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. This is often referred to as the jhana of equanimity. But when I'm teaching jhanas, I don't say focus on equanimity because that's a little hard to know what exactly to focus on. I say focus on quiet stillness because that's what you find in the fourth jhana. If you focus on quiet stillness, you will be focused on equanimity. All right. It's a it's a deeper state by noticeably quite a, ma a, a good bit. Um, very peaceful, very pleasant to be there, very emotionally neutral. Uh, Ayakema talked about the third jhana being like sitting in the mouth of a well. Fourth jhana, you drop down to the bottom of the well. It's not a free fall, but there is a sense of drifting down as you enter the fourth jhana. And the drifting down can last 20 seconds, a minute. Some people get it even for five minutes before it settles into quiet stillness. And by that point, you have a mind where... <clears throat> Mindfulness is fully purified by equanimity. You've got a really supremely concentrated mind at that point. You've got, well, mindfulness that is of the highest quality. The simile is of a guy covered with a white sheet, completely covering him. At first, I didn't understand why it was a white sheet. When I would get to the fourth jhana, my eyes were closed and it was black. Right? It says uh, a pure, bright mind. There was nothing bright there. It was black. Uh, what's going on? Uh, I talked to Ayakema. She asked me to describe fourth jhana. I described, she said, that's fine. Don't worry about it. 
So I had to put it in the I don't know bucket for 16 years. And then I went on retreat with Venerable Pawak, who's a jhana master from Southern Burma, who teaches Vasudhi Magajanas. And he was having a sit in access concentration, just following our breath for three or four hours in a sitting. I was getting more concentrated than I'd ever been before. And sometimes I would fall of that, out of that into the jhanas that I'd learned from Ayakim. I never got anywhere near his the Sudhi Maga jhanas on that retreat. Um, and when I would hit fourth jhana, it would be bright white. It, w- it was like I was sitting in an open field on a bright sunny day with a white sheet over me and my eyes open, just like the simile. This pointed out to me that the Buddha and his monks were experienced levels of concentration much deeper than I had been experienced prior to that, which makes sense. You know, they weren't doing 45 minute or an hour sitting. Yeah, they go sit for three hours. Take a pee break, sit for three more hours. So they're getting supremely concentrated. And if you get supremely concentrated, you get a a, a, a visual whiteness that will remain through all of these four jhanas. Okay. So, yeah, what I teach on the retreats, because I'm teaching lay people who are on a 10-day, two-week retreat, is not the same depth of concentration that the Buddha and his monks were experiencing. But what I'm teaching is what the students can experience, and what they experience does get them sufficient concentration to enhance their insight practice, which is what comes next. But I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions on the jhanas. Wayne, you're, you're still muted, Wayne. Sorry, there you go. Okay, so um, the, uh, on the jhanas, I have been to uh, a couple of uh, of talks by uh, uh, some monks, Buddhists, uh, they, they'll remain nameless, who really kind of poo-pooed the jhanas, <laughs> as if that's something you shouldn't do, that's something that should be avoided. And uh, and it's not necessary. Just go right by those and go right to and and it's insight. And, and so the thing that struck me on that when I would hear that is I would go through and I've got several of the Nikaya books, you know, the books, and I would go through and I would count how often the Buddha would talk about the jhanas and how often he would talk about vipassana. And he seemed to spend a lot of time talking about the jhanas. So I thought there must be something more to this. And so I being a little boy and my mother telling me don't have a cookie, I would immediately go to the cookie jar looking for a cookie. So that's kind of like where I'm at now. (laughs) Yeah. That's all right. All right. So a history of the jhanas in the West, because you're not the first person to basically ask the exact same question. So over time, the understanding of what constitutes a jhana changed. You can actually see this through the literature. There's the jhanas that the Buddha and his monks were doing, which is what I just described to you. Then there was the Abhidhamma. The Abhidhamma was composed, let's say, starting about 200 years after the Buddha's death. And you read that, and there's a deeper level of concentration there. Okay, they're getting stronger. In fact, they've gotten so much stronger that the Vitaka Vichara as thinking and examining doesn't fit their experience anymore. So instead of going, oh, we seem to have strayed off course, they just changed what Vitaka and Vichara meant and changed it into initial and sustained attention to the meditation object. Okay, and then you get to the Vimuti Maga and then eventually to the Vasudhi Maga. These are commentaries centuries after the Buddha's death. And by then, in the Vasudhi Maga, the understanding of the jhanas was that these states were so deep that only one in a million people who came to meditation could enter the first jhana. It literally says that in the Vasudhi Maga. It's not phrased like that. It's a Those who come to meditation, only one in a hundred or one in a thousand can get to preliminary nimitta, a circle of light you're supposed to have appear. And of those who get the preliminary, only one in a hundred or one in a thousand get the full-on nimitta. And of those who can get the full-on nimitta, only one in a hundred or one in a thousand can get the first jhana. Let's take the most optimistic, 
one in a hundred times one in a hundred times one in a hundred is one in a million. So of those who come to meditation, one in a million people get to the first jhana. This is clearly not what the Buddha was doing because everybody's doing jhanas, as you found, all over the suttas. <clears throat> so they had changed it. Unfortunately, Theravadan Buddhism is Vasudhimaga Buddhism. They may claim that they follow the suttas, but they're following the Vasudhimaga. Mm -hmm. Rather than looking at what the Buddha had to say, they're looking at what some editor put in a book nine centuries after the Buddha's death in a completely different culture. Okay? And that's what Theravadan Buddhism is. And so they understand the jhanas as these unattainable states. So now our teachers go to Asia. It's hippies from America coming over and they want to learn to meditate. Or, or the monks in Asia, who probably can't do the jhanas either, going to teach the jhanas to these Westerners? Well, no, of course not. Only one in a million people can do it. They're, not going, to, they're going to teach them following the breath and some metta and send them back to America. And that's what they teach us. Well, now people like you come along and say, well, what's this about the jhanas? And, oh, don't get, don't get, do that. You'll get attached. You'll, you'll get, you'll go down the wrong track. Mm -hmm. You know, <clears throat> anyone who is actually serious practice jhanas in any form, whether it's the Sudhi Maga or Sutta jhanas or what I'm teaching or anything, will realize that this is actually a very valuable tool and will want to share it with other people who can possibly learn it. But if you don't know the jhanas, then all you know is what you've heard about the jhanas. And you heard your teacher say, oh, don't do that. It's a waste of time because their teacher told them, oh, don't do that. It's a waste of time. There also seems to be, if you're pursuing the Vasudhi Maga jhanas, a tendency to spend all of your time trying to get there, never doing your insight practice. And if you do get there, spend all of your time hanging out there and never doing your insight practice. But what I'm finding, I mean, I've, I've taught over 150 retreats now. So I figure I've had over 1,500 students I've taught jhanas to now. Not everybody got into the jhanas, but at least I was attempting. And a bunch of them did get into the jhanas. Yeah, at first it's a new toy and you're totally fascinated with it. But we're Westerners, we have our famous short attention span. And so you get high, it's wonderful. You get high, it's wonderful. You get high, okay, been there, done that, what's next? What's next is insight practice. And so, yeah, people do tend to become a bit of a jhana junkie when they first learn them. But my job is to keep an eye on that. And as soon as they are good enough at the jhanas to become a jhana junkie, to push them into doing insight practice. And once they start getting the insights, it's far more interesting than just getting high. Can I so, ask one more question? Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, is it possible for somebody to experience these jhanas without having had these instructions? I did. And okay. so, so do about 10 to 20% <laughs> of the people who come on my retreats. <laughs> This okay. is the natural way the mind tends to go. If you get quiet enough and you focus on some pleasure, it's quite likely it'll take you into the first jhana. That's how I got there the first time. If you do metta meditation for a long enough period of time, it's not surprising that that beautiful feeling of metta takes you into the first or even the second jhana. Uh, so as I say, yeah, about 10 to 20% of the students on my retreats found their way in with no instruction. Uh, basically, I'm not putting the jhanas in my students' mind. I'm just telling them to stop doing the stuff that's covering it up. It's in there, and all you've got to do is stop covering it up with all of your distractions, all of your hindrances. If you stop doing that, then the natural mind shines forth. And what's your natural mind? Oh, a gleeful, happy, contented, equanimous mind. Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that I am just a retired hippie computer programmer, the fact that I can teach this stuff isn't about me. It's about the fact I'm teaching humans who have this capacity. And yeah, 
it, it, people do stumble in all the time. Viraj. Ellie, yeah, really interesting discussion. I think I think there's a lot of debate around what some samadhi is and what these genres are about. I think I think you've made a great point there in terms of uh, the the depth uh, that is involved in in practicing these jhanas. Uh, so my question is, um, in the night of the awakening, the Buddha um, or, or, or the, the Siddhartha at the time, he was um, thinking of what to do and how to um, attain um, awakening or enlightenment. But what what directed his mind was towards his childhood childhood experience of entering into the first jhana. Right. And however, he had two teachers that he went to, the Alara Kalama and the Karama Putta, where he um, developed the jhanas and he attained, I think, the sphere of nothingness and then uh, under Uddha Karam put the uh, anti Nirodha Samapati. But his mind didn't think of those jhanas that he developed under those teachers, but what his mind went was his, uh, to his childhood experience. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that there was a difference in those two? So what was the actual jhanas that he practiced in the night of awakening? Right. Is it that some of these jhanas, when you go so deep into them to the exclusion of everything else, that you lose complete awareness of your surrounding, that you don't hear sounds and everything, and then there it doesn't allow for inside practice? Or when you get into the fourth jhana, does it sh or should it still allow awareness, maintaining awareness to uh, practice yeah. inside? Okay, so... <clears throat> so he stumbled into the first jhana as a child, sitting under the rose apple tree so wayne there's somebody else who stumbled in on their own without instruction and then he eventually goes and studies with the two teachers the first teacher says that the seventh jhana the realm of no thingness is the goal of the path once you get there there's no dukkha right but the buddha yeah. comes out or siddhartha comes out and goes no man i come out this dukkha's still here this ain't it so he leaves he studies with udaka Ramaputta. And he's teaching neither perception or non-perception, not, not cessation. And he says that's the end of the path, or he says that Rama said that's the end of the path. And the Buddha comes, or Siddhartha comes out and goes, no, it's still dukkha. So he leaves that, and he begins practicing austerities. Probably under the Jains, the austerities practices he undertook are also austerity practice for the Jains. And he does that, and after six years... We don't know how much time he spent with each teacher in austerities. Maybe it was two years of each or whatever. He's like, no, none of this is working. It's got to be some other way. And so now he's thinking, what, what could I do? And he remembers the incident from his childhood. And specifically, he remembers that pleasure there was not sensual pleasure. It was a pure form of pleasure. Could these jhanas be the way to awakening? In other words, could these be a means instead of an end, which is what his teachers had taught him? Could I use the mind state generated by these jhanas as a pathway as opposed to a destination? And then he realizes he's so emaciated he can't do jhanas, so he starts eating, his five friends leave him, he's gets his strength back, and at some point, and we don't know how much long later, I would guess a few months later, he sits down under the Bodhi tree on his birthday, full moon in May, and wakes up. But he practices the jhanas and then does insight practice. He doesn't do insight practice in the jhanas, and we'll get to that in the next section after sure. we answer a few more questions. I've just got a quick question on um, uh, my experience, a recent experience, and um, you were just explaining it, and uh, that's when I realized it's about this pity building up um, in in the in the head and around the neck and the and the cheeks, and at one point it grew so strong, and I had not followed any instructions, so I hadn't heard this. It was so strong, I thought, okay, I'm going to run my mind down the body. And then the next second I know is it's just spreading so fast. Um, even initially, it was very weak. And then it started to grow very, very strong throughout mm -hmm. the body, like you're just immersed in it. 
And I did not know that was leading to the first jhana or whether it is the first jhana. So I just suddenly stumbled upon it. Yeah. Um, so it's really great to hear that, you know, sometimes we do get into these states and we don't know where we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one of the questions um, I had was, sometimes I feel that we have kind of unresolved issues in the past popping up mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. that can really drag you down. How do we manage that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so when your unresolved issues come up, if you can just set them aside temporarily, that's the thing to do. But often you can't. And so now you're going to need to work on it. And basically the spiritual path is probably not going to be the most useful thing other than to see the impermanent nature of whatever happened in the past it's gone to see the dukkha nature of it yeah that's there to see i'm clinging to something from the past why um you know what i usually recommend is okay western psychotherapy is really good for dealing with unresolved stuff and so that's what I recommend, rather than trying to do it on the cushion. In addition to doing what you do on the cushion, find a therapist, a good friend, somebody to talk to about it, rather than trying to use a, a spiritual thing. Because often what happens if you try and use a spiritual practice to handle an unresolved uh, stuff, you wind up spiritual bypassing, and that's, that's going the wrong direction. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Don. Uh, yeah, I, I happened on um, a real strong meditation. I was uh, driving at first. And I listened to like three hours of Dharma, something about don't look down on your defilements. They'll laugh at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to myself, oh, I'm doing this all wrong. And by the time I got back home, I had this feeling of like a uh, hundred percent belief that like I knew that I put on my EEG headset that it's going to be a strong meditation mm -hmm. and I got into this three-hour meditation that I lost track of time it was so stable no thought that I I could get hit by a truck and it wouldn't knock mm -hmm. me out of it um but it got to a point where I was sort of concerned that I wasn't breathing enough that I was going to run out of oxygen. Yeah. yeah. And then um, I got to a ceiling after a while and there wasn't anything else I could, it just got to a ceiling. I saw this um, image. It wasn't imaginary. It was like a, somebody put a picture up on the ceiling and mm -hmm. it was geometrically spaced like fuzzy stars. And it, it was may have been pulsing but not very much it was just there and i found that two different times i meditated and i haven't got to that state since but i didn't know if that um that image that i saw identical twice that wasn't imagination if that's characteristic of anything yeah so as i mentioned for the vasudhi magajanas you have to get the nimitta. The nimitta is usually described as a circle of light. There are other nimittas, but that's the common one. Sort of like you're looking at the full moon or a searchlight. Okay, on the way to getting there, one of the things can show up is a diffuse white light. All right, and so it's it's just, it's got bright behind your eyes like somebody's inching up a dimmer switch in the room, or the sun has come out from behind a cloud, something like that. What you got was in between. What's going on is good concentration. In other words, your mind is getting quieter. When your mind gets quieter, it's not that the neurons keep, stop firing. It's that it becomes more random throughout your brain, including your visual cortex. And random firings in your visual cortex at first show up as just a diffuse white light. And as you get quieter, the random firings become more and more proportional to the density of the neurons, including in your visual cortex. In the center of your cor visual cortex is a circle of very densely packed neurons. That's why, you know, if you want to read something, you've got to look at the word. You can't really read with your head twisted off a little bit to the side. You've got to 
really look at it. Okay, and that's the hmm. center of your visual cortex. But now it's firing more than the other parts of the visual cortex. And on the way to it turning into like a spotlight shining in your eyes, you get the what you just described. Okay. So a pattern between the diffuse white light and the circle. And yeah, so it's a sign of good concentration. What should you do with it? It's just a sign. I mean, when you drive into town and it says, entering Oakland, that's where I am, entering Oakland, I don't have to get out of my car and uproot the sign and put it in the trunk. I just know where I am. When you see that, you just know, yeah, we're pretty concentrated right now. Okay. I guess the only thing that's holding me back from getting there is um, just a, a, just a tinge, like a subtle tinge of trying, mm -hmm. like uh, effort, like wrong effort or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and it feels like I'm falling back in a chair and I have to catch myself and hold on, mm -hmm. you know, to keep from falling. And that's, yeah. those, those are the two things that are stopping me right now. Yeah, the body distortions, like thinking you're falling back when you're not actually falling back, that's a sign of good concentration. The effort, it's got to be right effort, right? Yeah. Not too much, not too little. You still got to do the work, but you can't, you can't at all be focused on something down the road. You can't be focused yeah. on a given point. You got to just be doing the thing that is necessary to do. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Bill. Uh, this is not really a question about Jonas, but uh, an interesting observation in working or watching the uh, work of Peter Levine, working with people that have uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, uh, presenting as uh, sort of rigidities, uh, various kinds of rigidities and postures and in movement. Mm -hmm. And during his work with such people, um, one of the signs of, that he notes for freeing up these rigidities is what I've heard described as being pity, the, the bubbly, uh, sparkly uh, sort of phosphorescent or, but just in terms of a sensory experience, mm -hmm. uh, energy moving through a limb or something like that, that seems to be uh, preceding or a uh, part of the first jhana. Yeah. Yeah. PT shows up in a lot of different ways. I mean, it can be minor glee. It's probably the same neurotransmitters. It's PT. It's the same as Kundalini energy. It's the same as the Tibetan Tumo energy. Um, it has uh, some similarities to sexual energy. So yeah, I mean, everything we know is neurotransmitters. And so how it gets triggered and what you do with it is what matters. And for the jhanas, you trigger it with good concentration and then you use it to build even more concentration. And you take the even more concentration to do your insight practice, which we'll get to right after Victoria's question. Um, I just did a workshop last weekend with um, Nikki Mirgafori. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, on the White Casina. And just what you just said a minute ago, um, uh, I mean, talking about this white, the white light and everything, because she people were asking her what why that particular casino meditation etc as opposed to the others and so i wondered um because the whole day we just looked at this white disc like when we walked around with it we sat with it we <laughs> laid down with it um so i'm just wondering how that connects with this the this suffusion of white light it's an attempt to get there okay the disc is an attempt to get there this comes out of the Vasudhi Maga. this is not described in the suttas Okay, it, it's listed in a later sutta. Okay, but it's not described or anything like that. And I suspect that it was inserted quite a bit late. Uh, but in the in the Vasudhi Magga, it talks about this. And so the idea is you stare at a disc. And then say, say it's a red disc. If you stare at it, say, say it's the size of a dinner plate and it's across the room. 
and then you close your eyes, you're going to get a green after image. Now, is your concentration good enough to sustain the green after image? That's the red casino. If you stare at a white disc, you close your eyes, you're going to get a black after image. I don't see that working really well. Um, but if you stare at a white disc long enough, apparently you can start generating what I talked about, the diffuse white light and so forth. But it's due to the concentration. And you're sort of, I guess you're fatiguing the, the, the visual field around that in some way. I, I'm not sure exactly how it's supposed to work. I, I figured out how they were doing it to generate the casino in talking with a number of other people, including uh, consciousness researchers and neuroscientists and so forth. But I'm not quite sure how the white casino is supposed to, the, the white thing that you're looking at is supposed to give you a white thing when your eyes are closed. I, I have no clue about that. You'll have to ask Nikki again about it. Yeah, I have no idea. I it was more I was curious more about the not not the optical effect, but more the symbolism of the white as a kind of um, you know, like the ultimate like containing all colors or something like that. I I don't know. I didn't I didn't get it. So I just <laughs> it's just that what you said about the white reminded me of that. Yeah. Actually the Vasudhi Maga makes a big deal about using a brown casino to start with. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I so, guess it was advanced advanced practice that's why i didn't get it okay thanks sorry to lead you down the garden path i, I it yeah, just no, it's fine okay, thank you so the next thing is insight but we've been here for an hour and a half i think it's time for a break so uh it's the bottom of the hour uh let's do a 10 minute break so at 20 minutes before the hour we're starting on insight and how jonas and insight fit together Okay, before we start on insight, there are a couple of things in the chat. Where does Samadhi fit in with the jhanas? So I'll give you a quote from the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. You've probably heard of the Satipatthana Sutta. I hope so. And what, O monks, is right concentration? Sama Samadhi. What, O monks, is Sama Samadhi? Secluded from sense desire, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, one enters and remains in first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. This is right concentration, sama samadhi. So the jhanas are right samadhi, appropriate indistractability. And then someone wrote about experiencing a jhana uh, just after coming off retreat and it faded. Uh, yeah, that's pretty common. What you probably will need to do is go back on a retreat and practice jhanas during the retreat to such an extent that you're really clear about what's going on. Uh, getting in a couple of times is probably not good enough, but if you can get in multiple times over multiple days, then you get a real sense of what's going on, and then you can come home and keep them for a while. It's, keeping them is dependent upon how well you know them, and how good your daily practice is. And so going on a retreat and practicing jhanas takes care of the how well do you know in part. And then coming home, um, hopefully that will inspire you to have a really good practice and you can keep them going. Uh, is Naroda Sampati useful in the path of awakening? So this is the state of suspended animation, basically, where, yeah, you're just gone, you checked out. Um, Supposedly, Mahamogalana, who was the Buddha's left-hand disciple, uh, reached awakening by coming out of that state and watching his sense of self reassemble. Okay, but and it, the Buddha used it at times to escape from his bad back. Uh, the Buddha had a bad back. I think probably most people are aware of that. Anyhow. Towards the end of his life, it was so bad that if he really wanted some relief, he would go into the state of Naroda, where he was just checked out, and it, it, it didn't bother him until he came out of it. So uh, I'd say probably not really all that useful. Um, can you explain why body distortions are a sign of good concentration? 
Um, why would that be the case? Um, when you're well concentrated, you are so much paying attention to one thing that you're not processing the signals from the rest of your body in the usual way. And this leads to the distortions. Um, it, so many people reported this. Uh, it, it's, it's quite common. I would say pretty much every retreat I've ever taught, somebody comes to an interview and says something like, my hands felt they were, like they were big as baseball gloves. Or I thought I was sitting upright, but I was leaning over. Or I thought I was leaning over, but I was sitting upright. Or, yeah, all sorts of things. These, these are very common. It's just a sign of good concentration. And I believe that it's because you're just not processing the signals from your extremities in the normal way. Most of us are not bilaterally symmetric. In other words, not ambidextrous. So your right hand, the right side of your body is more sensitive than your left hand the left side of your body if you're right-handed okay and so you start picking up those signals more than the ones from the left side of your body and you're just not processing in the way to give you the equal feel and so you think that whatever is going on, on the right side of your body it's making you lean or whatever i'm just guessing here i'm not a neuroscientist but um it's um it's a very common thing. I feel like when I sit for meditation after exercise, a 30 minute brisk walk on the treadmill, it's much easier to concentrate. Is there a correlation? Yeah, uh, if you're doing exercise, generally you've got enough energy going into doing the exercise that the usual sort of distractions are just sort of out of the way. If you sit down to meditate, they haven't had a chance to get back. This would be my best guess that what's going on. Is the description of the circle and field of white light from the view inside? When you see people glowing with white light, are they in a state of concentration? No, this is totally to do with your visual cortex in the back part of your brain and how it's responding to the signals that it's receiving. But when you see somebody glowing outside, yeah, you're going to have to talk to somebody else about that. I don't know anything about that, I'm afraid. Okay. All right. So on to what follows the fourth jhana. When one's mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, one directs and inclines it to knowing and seeing. This is what the jhanas are about. They are to generate a mind that's concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. Samadhi is usually translated as concentration. I want to translate it as indistractability, the ability to not become distracted. All right, so that's the concentrated part, pure and bright. If, you've, if you're in the jhanas, yeah, nothing else going on. You definitely feel like you have a pure, bright mind, unblemished, no defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, it's the kind of mind that can learn things. It's open. It's not full of all sorts of other ideas obscuring the view. And obtain to imperturbability. This is really important. Some of the insights we get on the spiritual path may be experienced as a little bit disturbing. I mean, when you actually deeply experience that everything in the universe that you were counting on for your security is impermanent, you might become a bit perturbed, right? In fact, it might be so perturbing that you don't even see it. But if you have an imperturbable mind, you can see it and begin to integrate that. Because as it turns out, the truth is all the things in the universe you were counting on to provide you security are impermanent. Okay, but when you first really get that, it could perturb you. So the imperturbability allows you to gain deep insights into things that you might have just looked away from uh, at some other time. 
So one then direction inclines it to knowing and seeing. Direction inclines it to doing an insight practice. One understands thus, this is my body having material form composed of the four primary elements originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness supported by it and bound up with it. So most of the stuff under body is pretty obvious. The four primary elements, earth, water, fire, and air, right? Uh, don't take it literally. Take it as solids, liquid, gases, and energy, if you want. They're aspects of reality, aspects of physical reality. Um, you don't have to discard your chemistry. Uh, born of mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent. Now, that might be perturbing. Your body's impermanent. Does that perturb you? Uh, subject to rubbing and pressing to dissolution and dispersion. Subject to dukkha. And this is my consciousness. Consciousness is the word vijnana. Vijnana is used in many different ways in the suttas. It's not a well-defined term. Uh, here, it's actually used as a synonym for mind. So we can translate in, this is my mind. Okay, this is my mind supported by my body and bound up with my body. So this would indicate that your mind is dependent on your body. And so if you're counting on your mind going on to another incarnation, uh, if your body doesn't go along, I don't think that's going to work. All right? So, yeah, people have their immortality projects. So they're looking for some way so that when their body dies, they don't really die. Okay? And here's one that's hinting that, yeah, uh, it's not going to work with your mind because your mind is definitely supported by your body and is bound up with your body. Okay? So, um, yeah, maybe there'll be questions about that. We have uh, a simile, and this is as suppose someone were to take a beautiful barrel green gem. Barrel is... Uh, a gem or actually a crystal that is very clear. They actually used to make eyeglasses out of barrel before they could make really high quality cheap glass. And so if you had a high quality pair of glasses, they were made out of barrel. They allow you to clearly see. And through that uh, Jim, there are threads, and a man with keen eyesight looks, and he can in see, he can see in, he has insight into what's in the barrel there because of the clarity. Okay, um, so this is a simile for insight. So basically, what the Buddha is saying is, after you have your mind concentrated, clear, sharp, etc. Direct and incline it to investigating mind and body. Now, if you're familiar with the four establishments of mindfulness, sometimes translated the four foundations of mindfulness, the first one is body. Oh, that's one of the things mentioned here. The second one is Vedana. Vedana is your initial categorization of a sensory input, and that's in your mind. Oh, that's mentioned too. The third one is mind states. Oh, yeah, that's definitely mind, right? And the fourth one is dharmas, which could be best translated here as phenomena. And what are the phenomena that are discussed in the Satipatthana Sutta that to be investigated? Well, most of them are mind, except for a few of them that are body. So basically, the idea behind the jhanas is to generate a mind that's most suitable for doing insight practice, most suitable for investigating, well, the four establishments of mindfulness, mind and body, right? And so there's 13 different practices given in the Pali version of the Satipatthana Suttas, right? And they're all about investigating mind and body. So the purpose of the jhanas is to generate a mind that will turbocharge your insight practice. Normally, when we look at the world, we're looking at it from an egocentric perspective. 
I mean, it looks like the world revolves around me. I mean, if I go outside and I turn in a circle, the world just revolved around me. It's obviously, right? The world revolves around me. Well, it turns out that's not really the case. If you really want to see what's going on, you, it's much better to look at it from a less egocentric perspective. Normally, we're looking at the world in terms of, can I eat that or will that eat me? Well, we get a little more sophisticated, but it's, is this something I want to get or is this something I want to push away? Right? And I, I going to get it, I'm going to push away. I am the center of it. And so if I'm examining the world from this egocentric place with me at the center, it's less likely that I will see what's really happening because it turns out the world doesn't really revolve around any of us. And so once you have a mind that's that concentrated, it's like your ego is gone, sit in the corner, and now you can see the world from a less egocentric perspective, which is going to give you a much better chance of seeing what's really going on. It's often talked about as knowing and seeing things as they are. But to me, that's a little too static, and I would prefer to translate it as knowing and seeing what's actually happening. Because it's a happening world. And so you want to see what's actually happening. In the Tibetan tradition, the Bodhisattva of wisdom is Manjushri. And he's usually depicted with a sword in his hand, which he uses to cut the bonds of ignorance. Jhana practice is just sharpening Manjushri's sword. Right? Not cut any bonds of ignorance yet. You still got to go wield the sword. And you don't want to make the mistake of just sharpening, just doing jhana practice, because if you do that, eventually you got no sword. The whole idea is you sit down, you get your mind as concentrated as you can. Four jhanas, eight jhanas, the eighth jhanas aren't talked about in most of the gradual training. Uh, but it's as sharp as you can. And then start doing an insight practice. Start investigating reality. Get your mind indistractably less egocentric and with penetrating insight and investigate mind and body. This is what insight practice is all about. And it works so much better with a turbocharged, jhanically concentrated mind. Not a lot to say there. There's a lot to do because the insights are what are going to set you free. You can practice the jhanas every day for three hours and you're never going to get enlightened. You're never even going to get to stream entry. You're only going to get there by getting enough insight that you let go. Remember, letting go, liberation in the palm of your hand. The only way you're going to let go is when you get enough insight such you can see there's not only nothing worth hanging on to, there's nothing that you can hang on to. And so you're willing to let go. Now this let go doesn't mean throw away, right? It just means that you recognize the impermanent, unsatisfactory, empty nature of everything in the universe. Any questions? Viraj. Yeah, Lee. Um, so with insight practice, um, when you experience stream entry, is it kind of like a momentary experience or does it occur over a period of time with multiple insights ar arising over that period of time? What's the experience like? Yeah. So it does vary from person to person. For in general, you get a number of insights along the way. It's sort of like, it's not Pokemon, it's insights. You got to collect a bunch of them. You don't have to get them all, but you've got to get enough insight so that you are willing to let go and let go in such a profound way that you have an experience without an experience -er. And that's the moment of the arising of stream entry where you have actually experienced for yourself that the idea of someone having the experience is an optional thing, but not really accurate about what's going on. The experience was experienced, but there was no body there experiencing it. But the only way to get there is to do enough practice to get close such that you let go enough that you have that experience. Because the, the, the reason for that question is I've heard certain people explaining their experience as something just magical and 
something blew out into air and then here you go they've had stream entry entry experience and so uh, but they don't talk about this accumulation of insights and having enough of them to finally let go of the concept of self right well not only the concept of self let go of everything but yeah the experience is profound enough that if someone's going to talk about it they're going to talk about that rather than all the lead up to it right okay yeah when you when you walk over to the edge of the grand canyon you don't really talk about the highway that got you there mm. but you had to have that highway yep. and you had to make the turns at all the right places and everything else but you know you look over the edge and it blows your mind same thing with stream entry sure. thank you right don so uh in concentrating first starting to meditate uh, it's a gradual process of calming. And then at some point with me anyway, it's like uh, instantly like a light switch has been thrown where everything suddenly shifts and it's everything feels good and it's instantly calm. Just like, is that a state that is um, normal that a light like a switch like instantly? Yeah. It's, it's the entry into uh, access concentration, sufficient concentration oh. to give you access to the jhana. But I wouldn't try and jump into the jhana immediately. I'd let it build. And there okay. is a sudden shift. So I was being interviewed by someone who was writing about the jhanas for his PhD thesis. And I said, yeah, when I get to access concentration, it's like, the, it's, like it's a thunk. And it drops into the state. And he started laughing. He said, yeah, I was interviewing Richard Shankman last week, and he described a thunk of falling into access concentration. Now, this is not always happening for everyone, OK? A lot of people get to access concentration, no thunk, no shift, no light switch, anything. Sometimes I get there, and there's a very definite thunk. Sometimes it just sort of gradually eases in. The better my daily practice and the more frequently I've been getting there, the more likely I'll get the thunk, right? If i am you know, been kind of goofing off, then it's going to be more gradual. For, for me, it's like right view, like right attitude, right view, like instantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's great. It feels wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the distractions are gone. Your mind has settled. It's a, it's a great place. Yeah, the hindrances have been abandoned. I mean, the hindrances of distraction. You just abandon the hindrances. With the abandoning of the hindrances, Pomoja arises. You got the Pomoja, right? So let it build for a while and then find something pleasant to drop the breath, if that's what you're using. Drop the breath and find something pleasant to focus on, like the smile or the tingly glow in your hands or whatever, and see what happens. Other questions about insight? We kind of figured there wouldn't be a lot of questions here, but just because there aren't a lot of questions, I don't want people to get the idea this is not important. This is the most important thing. All right. You got to get the insights to make the deep progress. Okay. You got to do all this other stuff to be able to get the insights, but you got to get the insights. That's where it's at. Wayne. Oh, wait, wait, Wayne, you're still muted. When I'm practicing and I go through what I think is like the jhanas and I get to this state where, you know, everything is just really just, I just feel calm. Everything is just calmed down. There, there are some thoughts, but they're like way wispy off in the background. And their mm -hmm. thoughts, like I think of them, like as little uh, bubbles in the beer, but, you know, they just rise and burn, rise and about that. They don't connect to create thinking. Uh, and then I will have kind of a thought come that's almost like, like an aha type mm -hmm. moment. It's almost yeah. like, oh, okay, I get that. But yeah. then when after I've completed my meditation, you know, my time timer goes off, okay, we're done. I don't always remember what that was. Yeah. Is that 
Is that possible? <laughs> yes, it's possible. And it's not useful to not remember. Yeah, so, that's what I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you want to try and keep your insights available, okay? Um, you get an insight and, you know, you forget about it and then you get it again and you go, oh yeah, I knew that, I forgot. You know, it's back there with your high school Spanish. You know, you go to Mexico for two weeks and your high school Spanish starts to come back. Yeah, well, you get an insight and if you don't keep it fresh, it goes back there with the high school Spanish until you get it again. So yeah, you get an insight like that, an aha, it's often good at that point to just say to yourself in words, I mean, to actually deliberately think, oh, I see that blah, 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 mean blah, blah, and blah. Interesting. So, you, so you're imprinting it more. Then when your timer goes off, think, did I get any insights? And if you did, what were they? Say them to yourself. If they seem really important, go write them down. If you go to my website and click on the essays, a lot of those essays were written because I had an insight and I wrote down some notes and then later I fleshed it out into an essay. Okay, so yeah, uh, if you read my book, uh, Dependent Origination and Emptiness, yeah, a lot of insights there that, uh, you know, made some notes or it was so profound I knew I would never forget it and then fleshed it out into a book. So, but that's a lot of insights over a number of years. But yeah, you want to keep them fresh. And one of the things to do is when you have one is to articulate it to yourself with deliberate thinking so you've got it clear. And then go back to, yeah, doing whatever your insight practice is. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Catherine. Yes. Hi. So I expected the three characteristics to show up here um, as the things to have insight about. Yes. Uh, seeing how suffering is working and not self. Yeah. And, yeah, and impermanence. And, and impermanence is mentioned, of course, and I'm really interested that you're talking about insight in a broader way that this capacity of seeing how things are can be expanded um, to look at more things. Right. But when you look at them, what you see that's going to be the most transformative is one or more of the three characteristics of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. If we go through the list, this is my body having material form composed of the four primary elements. Oh, uh, it's not a solid thing. So that's beginning to get towards Anatta there. Originating from mother and father. Oh yeah, that's a little bit more towards Anatta. Built up out of rice and gruel. Okay, so the body is becoming more and more Anatta. Impermanent. Oh boy, that's Anicca. Full mm -hmm. on. Subject to rubbing and pressing to dissolution and dispersion. That's Dukkha. Right, so it's Anatta. Anicca Dukkha. And this is my consciousness supported by it. Okay, it's not an independent thing, right? So that's kind of anatta mm -hmm. as well and bound up with it. And that's more anatta. So they're in there. I didn't mm -hmm. specifically mention them. But yeah, the most important insights are going to be the uh, insights into the three characteristics of Anicca Dukkha Anatta. Impermanence or inconstancy unsatisfactoriness or my favorite translation bummer <laughs> and anatta which is literally not self or corelessness or emptiness so those are the most important insights but they could be uh, personal insights along the way psychological insights that are very important in fact often the personal insights are in the way of seeing the real insights and you've got to get the personal insights out of the way so you can see the deeper insights. So any insight, any aha that's congruent with reality is very useful. But the ones that are about the impermanent, unsatisfactory, empty nature of reality are going to be the most transformative ones. Right. Thank you for right. painting and, that picture. Right. Thanks for the question. Okay, so um, now we get to stuff that people wanted to talk about earlier. 
besides jhanas, the uh, various psychic powers. So again, when one's mind is concentrated, pure and bright, etc., one directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body, one creates another body having material form, mind-made, complete in all its parts, not lacking any faculties. So that would be cloning yourself, it sounds like. It's material, right? And it's identical. <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I never managed to pull that off. In fact, I don't even see how you could pull that off. Maybe it means something else. We, there's a bunch of similes. Suppose a man were to draw a reed out from its sheath. He would think, this is the reed, this is the sheath. The reed is one thing, the sheath is another. Or a man were to draw a sword out of a scabbard. He would think, this is a sword, this is a scabbard. They're different things. Or pull a snake out of its slaw. He would think, this is the snake, this is the slaw. Therefore, one creates a mind-made body. Is everybody clear on that? No. <laughs> right? So what's going on here? Uh, I've heard it explained as learning to do out-of-body experiences. Right? Uh, okay. Um, you know, I read this. It was like, uh, this is some sort of psychic thing I don't understand. And so I, let's just set it aside for a moment here. And then we get to the knowledge of the modes of supernatural powers. When one mind is thus concentrated, etc., one ex exercises the various modes of supernormal power. Having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. He appears and vanishes. He goes unimpeded through walls, ramparts, and mountains as though they were space. He dives in and out of the earth as though it were water. He walks on water without sinking as if it is earth. Sitting cross-legged, he travels through space like a winged bird. With his hand, he touches and strokes the sun and moon, so mighty and powerful. He exercises mastery over the body as far as the Brahma world. Yeah, okay. I have never seen anybody walk on water. Well, one time in Sweden I did, in the winter. Okay, but I don't think that's what they're talking about. Um, I, I sometimes walk through walls. I use this trick called a door, but I don't think that's what they're talking about. All right. This is, this is magic, right? Okay. So I was in Portugal and uh, staying with a student who I became really good friends with, and he was very interested in lucid dreaming. And when we were talking, he mentioned wake-induced lucid dreaming. W-I-L-D, wild. And he said that it's possible to go from a normal waking state of consciousness directly into a lucid dream. And so, of course, I immediately looked it up in Google and read all about it. And the mind state you're to produce is very much like what you produce coming out of the fourth jhana. And now in a lucid dream, this is a dream where you know you're dreaming and you start trying to do various things, right? Like fly through the air or walk on water oh is that what's going on is the mind made body learning the wake induced lucid dreaming technique because what you're doing is you're creating another body right and then you go walk on water and fly through the air and all the rest of it this makes more sense to me i mean i have a background in science um, yeah, if somebody can really walk on water, I'd love to see that. You know, all you got to do is give a demonstration. I got San Francisco Bay just a couple miles down the road here. You know, walk over to San Francisco. Yeah, I'll believe you when I see it. All right. So I'm thinking that that's what's going on here. That this is basically learning to do wake induced lucid dreaming. Now, you might be thinking, well, do you have any other evidence for that? Well, actually, I do. In the Anguttara Nikaya, Book 3, Sutta number 60, a Brahmin is having a conversation with the Buddha about miracles. And the Buddha says, well, there's three miracles. And one of the miracles is these various things, walking the water, flying through the air. Another miracle is knowing the minds of others. 
And the Brahmin says, yeah, but those two only benefit the one who does them. It's like a private event. Oh, if you're having a lucid dream, it only benefits the one who does it. It's like a private event. So that matches as well. There's a third miracle, and that's the miracle of instruction. And actually, that is pretty miraculous. I'm sitting here in Oakland, California. I'm exhaling and flapping a, a loose piece of flesh in my throat, making some compression waves in the air that go into a microphone, get turned into digital stuff, go over the internet, come out of the speaker on your computer, go into your ear, and hopefully the idea I had in my mind when I exhale to make those sounds appears in your mind. That seems really miraculous. That seems even more miraculous than walking on water. And uh, Dika Nikaya number 11, the Buddha says, what is the miracle of instruction? And he gives the gradual training without the uh, supernormal powers. Okay, so yeah, this is what's going on here. All right, so that's what I'm going to say is going on with this. The first two of the six psychic powers are learning the wake induced lucid dreaming technique and then applying it. The next one is the knowledge of the divine ear. When one's mind is concentrated, etc., one hears both. Uh, one hears both kinds of sound, the divine and the human, those which are distant and which are near. So this is clear audience. You know, people have ESP, they can hear things far away. This, so this, that's what's being described here. It's, it's a well-known phrase. We have a term for it, clear audience. Uh, modern science says they can't detect it, but, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence all right we don't know what's going on but certainly it's reported enough that it got its own name all right and then the next one is knowledge of encompassing the minds of others uh, one directs and inclines it once it's concentrated one understands the minds of beings and persons have an encompass them with their own and he understands the mind with lust without lust with greed with, with hatred, without, with delusion, etc. The list actually is taken out of the Satipatthana Suttas, uh, jammed in here. I don't think it was originally there. But it's, this is mind reading. This is ESP. And, and we have the phrase, extrasensory perception. So this is another well-known thing. Well, interestingly enough, if you get well concentrated and you have a least bit of talent for any of this, that talent is enhanced. Okay, I can't, I can't claim that, you know, I go on retreat and I do the jhanas and I know what we're having for lunch. No, but I have had experiences now, whether it's just me misjudging the, the arithmetic around probabilities or picking up subtle cues, but I've had experiences that would match ESP and I have them more frequently on retreat when I'm doing a lot of concentration practice. We don't have to know what ESP is scientifically to say that it is a phenomena that gets reported and whatever that phenomena is, whether it's scientifically valid or not, and I'm not saying one way or the other, it does seem to be enhanced by a concentrated mind and it can show up as clear audience or as clairvoyance, knowing the mind of others, okay? And whether it's scientifically true or not, yeah, we'll leave that to the scientists to find out. And then there's the knowledge of recollecting past lives. With a mind thus concentrated, etc., one directs and inclines it to the knowledge of recollecting, well, it actually says previous dwellings. And then it says, one recollects one birth, two birth, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000, 100,000, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. Recollecting, there I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance, such was my food, 
such is my experience of pleasure and pain, such my lifespan. Passing away from that state, I rearose there, there too I had a name plan, etc. Okay. Um, in the first watch of the night, on the night of his awakening, the Buddha stepped through the first four jhanas, and then in some of the suttas, it says he re recollected his past lives. Now, as a mathematician, I always want to run the numbers. Okay, so first watch of the night, this is India, this is on the equator, so night and day are the same length, 12 hours, three watches of the night, right, so four hours. In four hours, the Buddha was able to remember 100,000 past lives, it said. So do the arithmetic, you can do this in your head, I'm sure, divide 100,000 into four hours. You do that, right, you all got it? Uh, seven tenths of a second. And not only that, in seven tenths of a second, the Buddha has to remember name, clan, appearance, food, pleasure, pain, and lifespan. That's eight things in seven tenths of a second. One fifty-sixth of a second to remember each one of these. Fifty-six different things a second, nonstop for four hours. I don't think we should take this literally. Um, there's a passage in um, one of Stephen Batchelor's books that I'll bring up and read to you in the moment when uh, my Kindle comes up. But before that happens, we can take a look at the next one, which is the divine eye, which is with one's mind thus concentrated, etc., one directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. Uh, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. He understands how beings fare according to their karma thus. These beings who were endowed with bad conduct of body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, held wrong views, undertook actions governed by wrong views, with the breakup of the body after death, have reappeared in a plane of misery, bad destinations, the lower realms, in hell. But these beings who were endowed with good conducts, good speech, mind, who did not revile the noble ones, held right views, undertook actions governed by right views with the break of the body, have reappeared in good destinations in the heavenly world. Okay, so on the night of his awakening, the Buddha supposedly, in the second watch of the night, watched beings re -arising, uh, dying and reappearing, passing and re-arising. So for four hours, the Buddha saw, sat there, and he's looking around going, well, that guy just died. Oh, this couple's having sex. Oh, he's going to be their baby. Oh, that guy just died. And oh, he was bad. Oh, that couple's had, he's going to have a miserable existence. So you're thinking the Buddha's sitting there for four hours watching people die and other people have sex? I'm not buying it. Okay. It just, it just doesn't fit with my picture of what was going on. Um, so this is from Stephen Batchelor's After Buddhism. Uh, uh, here we go. This critical assessment of the doctrines of rebirth and karma risk overlooking a crucial, important role that they have played in historical Buddhist cultures. To dismiss them as an unverifiable metaphysical beliefs of a former age fails to recognize how they serve to situate human life within a vision of the cosmos. Rather than conceiving of one's life as a brief flicker of self-interested consciousness on the surface of the earth, People with these beliefs could see, in the mythic language of their time, how all living beings are intimately connected to a complex series of causal conditions that preceded their existence, as well as to a seemingly infinite unfolding of future consequences, for which each was in some small way responsible. 
in providing a sense of humility, connectedness, and responsibility. This worldview encouraged people to consider the significance of their existence in the selfless context of the immensity of life and not reduce it to the surface of their egotistical greed and hatred. So that's going to be my interpretation of these last two. So these six supernormal psychic powers, I'm going to put in three categories. Wake into lucid dreaming, extrasensory perception, and a way of expressing the interconnectedness and giant unfolding of the human process over time in the mythic language of the time of the Buddha. I'm sure there are going to be some questions. What do you got? Josh. Uh, you're still muted. How about now? Yeah, good. And you're <laughs> you're a fabulous narrator as well as explainer. So thank you. Uh, I've heard Jack Kornfeld, Sharon Salzberg, Jack Engels, Joseph Goldstein all talked about being with Deepama and seeing her uh, in more than one place at one time, all kinds of mm -hmm. yeah. types of things. And I don't know, she'd hold a potato and it would get hot in her hand. And I guess what they used to, she used to tell them is don't get caught up in this stuff. This is something my teacher taught me, I think it was Mundira in Myanmar, but he taught me because I was able to understand that, but don't like think that this is anything that you need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I've heard these stories as well. I haven't seen any demonstrations yet. You know, I've heard a lot of stories. I've heard a lot of stories. Okay. okay, I mean, that, that's how I got to be a storyteller. I heard a bunch of stories, right? So I, I'm a scientist. I, I want to see for myself. So if you can cook a potato in your hand by holding it, please do so for me. Um, you know, I can find videos, I'm sure, on the Internet of, you know, people walking on water and flying through the air. You know, I just, I just want to see it in person. That's all I'm asking. Um, I can't say what Deepa Ma was up to. I can't say, I can't vouch for the veracity of what Sharon, Joseph, and Jack were saying. I, I just can't because I wasn't there. I'm getting it third hand. And yeah, I don't know. But I was just suggesting that there is a different way to see some of these powers. And I'm suggesting there's a different way to see them than the usual interpretations. I don't think you could find another teacher on this planet that would interpret these six things in the way I just interpreted them. Um, but I'm going to stick by my interpretation until somebody can give me a better demonstration. It's just as simple as that. Uh, it it fits my understanding of reality, and I don't I don't have to invent any magic. I know people want a magic Buddha. I've actually had teachers basically tell me that they didn't use those words, but that's what they were saying. They wanted a magic Buddha. I don't want a magic Buddha. I want a human being who is able to wake up because I'm not magic. I'm just a human being. I want a path that a human being can follow. If waking up involves me walking on water, I ain't going to get anywhere. So, yeah, I can do the jhanas. I can do insight practice. That's where I'm most interested. As for Deepa Ma saying, don't get lost in this. There's a story about a Tibetan who studied with his master. And, you know, after some years, his master says, OK, you got it now. Go off and practice. So the guy goes off, finds a cave and practices for 20 years. It was not too far from a village. There was a river between his cave and the village. And over the 20 year span, he learned to walk on water, shortcut into town. So he goes into town one day and he hears his teacher is coming and he gets really excited. So he goes back to his cave and it does whatever you do when you're going to have guests come to your cave, spits it up. And pretty soon his teacher shows up a couple days later 
and they have a joyful reunion. And eventually his teacher says, well, what have you learned? And he stands up all proud and he walks across the river and he walks back and he comes back to his teacher smiling big. And his teacher looks at him and says, you just wasted 20 years of your life as a bridge a quarter mile upstream. Uh, yeah, don't waste your time with these things, but do look at it in the mythic language of the time to situate human experience in a much bigger picture than your own self-interested existence. I think Stephen Batchelor nailed it. Thank Don. you. Right, Don. Yeah, can you imagine the shape we'd be in with this culture today if people had godlike powers? So. <laughs> no. So, you know, the precepts, you talk about the precepts, how hard would temptation be if you could be someplace in your mind that you're not supposed to be, that you knew everything that was going on in people's heads? Um, you know, the question for me is, I'd, I believe it's possible, and I've seen glimpses, but where's the need beyond self? Right. So if there's if there's no need beyond self, you know, you can't you, you can't get anywhere. But right. I, I would say the easiest thing when I think of supernatural powers, I think of things that I or people would know that you don't know where the information comes from. You just know something's true and then it happens to be true. Mm hmm. Um, and I know that cultivation of, in, in access concentration, you can cultivate right, or, um, you can cultivate to know the difference between yes and no answers. So do I turn right on the path? Do I turn left on the path to get water? You know, without knowing physically with any physical cues, you can, have the gut tighten or release and you can cultivate that and over time no right and no answers i do uh, know I, that i've tried that that practice and yeah i wasn't very good at it but if you can do it great because that way it's, you won't go thirsty <laughs> well it takes belief and it takes a need so a need beyond self so yeah. if you're practicing it, the need beyond self would be to help others. Right. Or to help yourself so you could help others. Yeah. That to get be... further on the path and so forth. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot out there that, you know, science doesn't know. I don't know. We don't know how, how to tap into it and everything else. Yeah. Just make sure you don't neglect the parts of the path that we know work. Get your mind concentrated and investigate reality. Bill. Are these divine powers uh, supposedly the result of jhana, concentration, or yeah. of insight? Uh, no, of jhana. When his mind is thus concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, it's the same sort of stuff, one directs and inclines it to exactly whatever the divine power is, walking on water, etc. So it's a result of jhana. Supposedly, the Buddha's evil cousin, Devadatta, uh, he's never referred to as a relative of the Buddha in the suttas, but never mind, um, was a, a master of the jhanas, learned all the divine, uh, all these supernormal powers, and, you know, used them to impress King Aj uh, Prince Ajitasattu into becoming his follower. And... Uh, yeah, the Devadatta story is interesting. If you go to my website and click on essays, I have an essay on Devadatta. Uh, but yeah, supposedly he could do all his evil stuff because he was good at the jhanas. Uh, I suspect that if you have evil intentions, you're not going to be good at the jhanas. But that's my guess. Catherine. Yes. Um... I just wanted to comment. I'm sort of understanding these last verses about uh, powers, cities, um, kind of like that was what they thought then about powers, which could be described as hypernatural or, um, yes, uh, sort of, and one is 
see one thing left out is how meditation makes you smarter and having a concentrated pure and bright mind is like a smarter mind so i think it would be great if humanity evolved to be able to have this kind of mind and then we could take care of each other better and yeah. have a better planet so there are powers or abilities that accrue i believe with um with concentrated meditation practice sustained meditation practice and i can certainly see it in my life yeah very definitely i mean if you get well a well concentrated mind you can more clearly see what's going on that makes you smarter if you have a well concentrated mind you're ego self has been quieted so now you can operate with a, not quite so much ego in the world and you learn that that actually works better so yeah definitely um but these are kind of miracle really yeah i mean yeah a su superpowers really yeah it's it, it they're absolutely amazing and i'm doing my best to teach them but <laughs> it's hard yeah so but yeah i mean it would be great if if this was taught in school if everybody could learn you know these jhanic states that would be fantastic but you know they can't even get mindfulness in some places because that's too weird and there there's definitely a lot of people in this country in particular who do not want smarter people i mean the republican party in texas back in the 1990s, I think it was, had a platform plank opposing teaching critical thinking. They wanted stupid people so they could do the stupid jobs. And, and so, manipulate yeah. them. Right, yeah. And so, that's why they also want to get rid of public education. Of course. Some of them. Yeah, no, it, it's really it got quite a mess here. But I can't solve all the messes, but I can share with you a little bit about the gradual training. Yes. Uh, right. Okay. Malcolm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lee. I've met Deepa Ma and I've um, you know, practiced with people that seem like they've read my mind, but I've never really worried about whether, you know, you can get divine eyes or walk on water or anything like that. For, because for me, it was all about just being free from suffering. So I've never, you know, I've heard, I've know, I know Stephen Batchelor, I've read Stephen Batchelor, I've read other people. Um, Alan Wallace, for example, is kind of diam diametrically opposed to Stephen Batchelor, and I've practiced with Alan. But uh, I'm wondering, I mean, for me, it's, I just kind of take it as it comes. So what's, what, what I experience myself is what is most important, mm -hmm. as, far yes. as, as far as I'm concerned. And, um, but I'm wondering why did uh, the Buddha put, put all, put these in, in this sutta? Why did he talk yeah. about it? Was it about kind of setting uh, the king straight about Devadatta? I mean, what was his motive for doing this? Because it's not, is it that important? It's, it's part of the gradual path to awakening he's talking about here. So why did he, what are your, what are your thoughts on why he put it in there? Okay, two possibilities. One, it wasn't in the original. And was inserted later because of course if you're a real spiritual teacher at that time and even later then of course you can walk on water and fly through the air i mean it, it, that's that's what it means to be a real spiritual teacher in the mind of a lot of people and so as buddhism was competing for support they had to prove that the buddha was the real guy because he could walk on water and fly through the air and all this other stuff so a lot of the miracle stuff was inserted later. Was this part of what was inserted later? I don't know. But the king wants to know what are some of the visible fruits of the spiritual life? And so the Buddha puts this in because this would impress the king. He's trying to help the king get a good night's sleep, basically, right? And if the king gains faith in the Dhamma, the Buddha figures, all right, this is going to bring some peace to his mind, which is what he's looking for, right? And so the Buddha puts this in there. Uh, yes, you can learn to the wake induce lucid dreaming technique and in their dreams walk on water. You know, the king is not going to 
learn that and walk on water or anything like that, but it will impress the king that this is a path that actually has a heart. It, it really does have amazing fruits. And so maybe he, he actually did put this in this one just because it would be useful as a, a pedagogical device for uh, helping the king to understand. But I can't say whether that was why or whether it was inserted later. It certainly, it's interesting because, you know, there's the polycanon. Did you know there are four versions of the polycanon? They're almost identical, but there's the Sri Lankan version and there's the Burmese version and there's the Thai version and one of them has a second version. I don't, can't remember whether it's the Burmese or, or the Sri Lankans. So there's actually four different versions and they're pretty similar. You know, it's mostly typos as to what's different. Um, but for the long discourses, the supernormal powers don't show up in all of discourse two through 12 in some versions. There's some versions without some, some of the suttas between two and 12 don't have the supernormal powers. And in some versions, all of the suttas between two and 12 have supernormal powers. So clearly inserting supernormal powers was a thing they did. Now, when did he get inserted? Who knows? I mean, maybe at the time of the death of the Buddha, there was no magic, no supernormal powers anywhere. Maybe there was some, um, the 24th sutta in the long discourses, a monk comes to the Buddha and says he's disrobing because the Buddha never performed any miracles. And the Buddha says, they ever tell you I was going to perform miracles? And the monk goes, no. Well, you didn't describe how the world ends or begins. Did I ever say I was going to describe how the world ends? No. So the monk left anyhow. But it, it's a poorly composed sutta. It's one of the most poorly composed suttas in the thing. But here's the Buddha not being said he never performed miracles right and yet there are other suttas with him. he's got fire and water coming out of either hand and all sorts of stuff so i'm most interested in trying to figure out what's there that doesn't have any of the magic it doesn't have any supernormal stuff what's the teachings when we remove all the stuff that's uh, a bit unbelievable and that's that's what i'm basing my study on mike Hi. Um, I think just to sort of comment on this, I think this kind of relates to the teachings of uh, the hindrance of doubt that I heard from Bhante Gunarantana that's slightly different than the way you presented it, where he was saying that when we, uh, that there's things that we could know from our own direct experience and there's things that we can know from speculation. And so if we, things that are speculation, if we put a belief in those things, and all of a sudden we find out that, oh, maybe it's been proven that nobody can walk on water or that nobody can do that, then that's just going to cause us to doubt the things that we actually also know from our own direct experience. So like mm. I know in the morning when I get up and I scroll on my phone, I'm looking at memes and stuff like that. Usually by the afternoon, I get in a grumpy state of mind. And I know that from my own direct experience. But, you know, but I don't know, uh, you know, I've got a friend who's a flat earther and I, and he, and I think the world's round, but I've never flown up and looked at it. Like all the science suggests that. But if I found out that the world was actually flat, that would cause me to doubt whether or not scrolling on my phone makes me, um, you know, grumpy in the afternoon. So it causes, it, it waters the seeds of doubt for your own direct experience when you place too much sort of like faith or hope into things that are just speculation and being able to draw the di distinction between what's actually speculation and what's actually um, your own direct experience. And so to me, all of this stuff about like, like, like sort of you had said, you haven't seen it. So it's just speculation. So I don't think there's really much use in, um, in a, in a hardcore belief in it. And until, until you have, until it is your own direct experience, which I believe the Buddha said is your truest teacher. Yes, exactly. No, this is a very great point, but I can guarantee you that worth the earth is round because I've been around it twice. So, <laughs> Linda. Hi. Um, first of all, today has been terrific. Thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate hearing your your voice and your stories again. Um, and I see that the day is kind of approaching the end. And I wonder if you could say something about the word gradual. How gradual is <laughs> <laughs> so it's sometimes translated as graduated and it's like a set of stairs 
it's gradual in the sense that each depends on the previous one to, to really get it fully fully in there. How quickly can you go up it? Um, yeah, you can certainly get up to the abandoning of the hindrances in fairly short order. It's going to help if you go on retreat. That's, you know, really get some serious meditation time. You can get enough concentration to abandon the hindrances. Almost everybody can get there. Um, and it doesn't take long, you know, a couple of retreats. I request that people who come on my retreats have done two one week or longer residential retreats or Zoom retreats that are that length. Um, and then I figured they're prepared enough that I can attempt to teach them the jhanas. Now, how long does it take someone to learn the jhanas? Uh, some people stumble in way before any instruction. They're quite good at it when they come on my retreat. Some people never get there. And it varies from person to person. And I couldn't tell you what all it depends upon. Um, <clears throat> I know people with really deep practice never got to the jhanas. I know people that, yeah, just breathe right in. Uh, insights, yeah, it's possible to get the insights without getting the jhanas. Once you've gotten the hindrances out of the way, examining reality, you'll get insights. It won't happen quite as fast as with a jhanically concentrated mind. It might not happen as deep as fast either, but you can get them. I doubt you can walk on water. Okay, so think think of it more like a set of stairs and it's it's just easier to get to step number two if you do step number one first keep the pre precepts then you you can guard your senses better and with guarded senses you can be more mindful and if you're mindful you realize you can be content with little and with being content with little makes it much easier to abandon the hindrances etc great thank you so much okay so the last two questions before we wrap this up victoria You're still muted. Yeah, thanks. No, I, I, I lost the whole window for a second because I, I looked up a word. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, well, I guess this is going to be an endless, um, endless pursuit for me. But I, this whole thing of the walking on water and all these things, I think about the other, the other, you know, major world religions and this whole issue of faith and what the word faith means in um, Pali. Well, I, that's why I'd rather hear you say rather than um, than yeah. Google. Um, <laughs> but the but the sense it still brings me back to what I asked before about the um, you know what would Buddha say in the sense of um, and you said a lot of the supernatural attributions are later brought in later, so that makes me wonder um, you know the what would Buddha say thing that um, Buddha's whole point was to help you know, to the, the end of suffering, uh, he teaches, right. Duke, you know, suffering and the end of suffering. So if we keep going back to that statement and that, that goal, it seems to me that, that all these other things are, are distractions in a way. Yeah. And I don't know how electricity works. I mean, I, <laughs> so like for me, um, the important thing is to try to, um, tried to become enlightened and and like all these to me everything's a miracle like just the fact i can like have food on the table that i didn't create myself is already so um so do, do you feel like that's all connected in some way like the this um again the the tendency in human nature to like have something to worship or something outside of oneself the um do you see that all as connected with these these last sort of supernatural things that we study yeah, I think that's there. People people want a magic Buddha. They want one who can walk on water and fly through air, so they stuck it in the suttas. Or it was just part of the culture. If you were a real teacher, then you had to claim that you did that or nobody would believe you. I mean, if the Buddha started explaining quantum mechanics, nobody was going to pay any attention. So he had to explain things in terms of, oh, yeah, there's uh, 31 realms of existence. And if you're bad, you wind up in hell. And if you're good, you wind up in the Deva realm. But the Deva realm is too pleasant. You'll never practice. So you might and you'll die and you'll be back here. You might as well practice now. He's just trying to be, convince people to practice. As for the word sada, which gets translated as faith, I prefer to translate as confidence. I found a path that I am confident is going to lead me to a better place. That's why I'm going to follow it. And that's what this 
gradual training is. It's a path that I find worth following. When I came first taught it to me, it was like, it was like I went into that retreat with a bunch of uh, sticky notes with all these ideas from Buddhism. And when she t finished teaching this, I knew where to stick each sticky note. This is Sila, this is Sa uh, Samadhi, and this is Panya. These are practices that are aimed in this direction. It all started making a whole lot more sense once I got a, a sense of this is what the Buddha is trying to teach, and he's trying to teach it to help us get out of dukkha. Yeah. All right, Margarita, and then we close this out. Um, thank you, Lee, for this wonderful day. Um, so could you explain what the experience of insight provides us to awaken that is not found in other parts of the practice? So in order to awaken, what the Buddhist strategy is, is to uproot the sense of self. The reason for doing that is so that we uproot the craver and the clinger. Remember, he said, dukkha arises dependent on craving and clinging. Okay. Right. And, you know, he says, don't crave or cling, but we all still crave and cling. Right. So we got to uproot the craver, the clinger. In other words, we've got to penetrate deeply enough into the nature of reality so that we don't conceptualize someone who's going to get something or who has gotten something. And in order to do that, we need to really deeply understand the nature of reality, in particular in the three characteristics of everything is impermanent changing is going to eventually disappear nothing is going to give us lasting satisfaction and everything is arising dependent on other things by gaining that deep understanding deep enough it loosens the tentacles on the sense of self hopefully enough eventually that yeah you stop conceiving of a self you i mean i grew up believing in santa claus and then one day i got inconvertible, incontrovertible proof that there was no Santa Claus. It was just mommy and daddy. And, it, you know, it was gone. There was no more guy living at the North Pole. And I didn't conceive of it anymore. But this like is that. the part, this is a part that I don't understand, uh, because I've known quite a few people who consider themselves materialists. They have no spiritual inter interest whatsoever. They don't practice. Um, they know very well that uh, the self that they have is a representation based on memory mm -hmm. and what have you, but that doesn't stop them from craving and wanting and all right. the rest of it. So when you're, and since there are many different Buddhist schools that have um, mm, different presentations of understandings of what sunyata or shunyata is, Mm -hmm. or self or not self or no self. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy to me what is meant by, by this. Okay. Uh, what it's meant is that you have no more basis for selfish action, right? So if you think that the earth is flat and if you go six miles out to sea, you fall off the edge of the world, you're not likely to go for a ride in a friend's sailboat. You're making a decision based on an illusion. If you find out that the earth is round, they take you up in, in a, uh, a SpaceX capsule and you see it's round, they explain gravity. You go back to the beach, it looks the same, but you no longer conceive of the edge of the world and you're no longer afraid you'll fall off. We're trying to do the same thing with the illusion of self is penetrate that illusion well enough so that we don't do any more craving and clinging. And this practice says it takes us in that direction. And yeah, I've, I've got enough sada, enough confidence in it. I'm certainly not as selfish as I used to be. So, okay, I'll, I'll keep going on it and see what it'll do for me. And yes, it's possible to get to the intellectual understanding of not self but not the felt experience. And the felt experience is what's required. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Uh, alrighty, so the last little bit here. The knowledge of the destruction of the Asifas. The Asif word Asifa gets translated here as cankers. I've seen taints, influxes, outfluxes. It literally, it, co it comes from the secretion of a plant, okay? Think of a poppy plant. If you cut it with a razor blade, what comes out? Uh, that's, a, that's an asava. But it, what happens if you put that asava on your tongue? You become intoxicated. And so that's how it's being used here. So when one's mind is concentrated, etc., one directs it and inclines it to the knowledge of the destruction of the intoxicants. One understands it how it really is. This is dukkha. This is the origin of dukkha. This is the cessation of dukkha. This is a path of practice leading to the cessation of dukkha. One understands that it really is. These are the intoxicants. This is the origin. This is the cessation. This is the path leading to the cessation of these intoxicants. Knowing and seeing thus, one's mind is liberated from the intoxicant of sensual desire, the intoxicant of existence, and the intoxicant of ignorance. So I heard a talk by Eric Kolvig one time, and he said, samsara is not a wheel. It's a drunken party in a casino. <laughs> Our job is to sober up, find the exit, and get out. And what are they serving in this drunken party at the casino? Sense desires, becoming, ignorance. Sense desires, that's, well, that's pretty obvious. I think we all know what sense desires are. Becoming, it could be becoming in this world. I want to become rich and famous or whatever other crazy thing we want to become. Or it could be becoming in a future world. I want to become a deva or I want to be reborn in a family with a Mercedes Benz or whatever fancy becoming you want to make up. And we get intoxicated by that. And ignorance, we're not intoxicated by pursuing ignorance, we're intoxicated out of ignorance, okay? Because we're ignorant, we're intoxicated. And our job is to overcome the asavas. And the way to do that is to clearly see what's going on. Remember, if we remove the supernormal powers there, we have the insight one direction inclines to knowing and seeing this is my body, etc. This is my mind. The insight into the three characteristics as related to body and mind. And then this is what follows if you leave out the supernormal powers, the overcoming of the osophists. And having overcome the ignorance of the fact that the self is only illusion and not the most important person in the universe, then that allows you to overcome the tendency for craving and clinging and thereby put an end to dukkha. And this is, this is what we're after on the spiritual path. And this is the ultimate of all of the uh, fruits of the spiritual life. There is no greater fruit of the spiritual life than overcoming dukkha. Any questions about the asavas? Okay, so a couple of things before we close this out. First, Heather Sundberg and I are doing a three-day weekend retreat the 19th, 20th, and 21st of May. May 19, 20, 21. It's on my website on the schedule on emptiness. Heather is a very brilliant emptiness teacher. She teaches emptiness from the Thai forest tradition which you might not be familiar with. And I'm going to do what I can about teaching emptiness from the suttas, right? And how they sort of blend together. So I think that will be a very interesting weekend, long weekend. Uh, this is the weekend before Memorial Day. Uh, and so I invite all of you to come for that. It'll be online. And um, yeah, so I want to put that out there. And I want to say, yeah, they say that teaching the Dhamma is a good way to make good karma, to make good merit. So may any merit from today's teachings 
be for the benefit and liberation of all beings everywhere.